Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Skylar. Thank you, Cheryl, for being here. And uh, we're going to have, a, I guess, a fireside chat. Uh, picture Skylar has up there, I guess, a summertime type fire and all that. And what we're going to talk about, discuss with Cheryl, is actually her new book, Let, Let Go to Lean, Six, ha Six Habits for Happier, More Independent Teams. Here's the cover. Actually, I actually have the cover off the book just because I want to have the book here to <laughs> reference a little easier. Um, and also, too, um, around this topic that we'll be talking about here um, with Cheryl, also, too, coming up uh, July 23rd through 25th is the Lean Coaching Summit. So at the Lean Coaching Summit, you'll be able to learn directly more about this from Cheryl, some uh, a couple of companies and multiple keynote people, multiple keynotes from each company, sharing what they're doing with uh, – with uh, what Cheryl's going to talk about today, you know, horizontally and vertically and throughout their whole, whole organization. So again, with that, welcome everyone. Thank you, Cheryl. And I'll just um, kick off with a question. Actually, if folks have questions, they can post it in the chat. We'll get, try to get to many of those as possible. But um, tell us, how did you begin your journey on um, understanding what it takes for leaders to uh, focus on developing their teams? So, <laughs> I mean, there's my original journey and then there's the journey that led to this book. So it's actually only about uh, six years ago, I was doing continuous improvement work for the state of Illinois in their adjudication department, which is where they do workers' comp claims. And they were putting in first-line supervisory training, which in the, you know, from my experience was never that interesting either way. But I could see it wasn't being done very well in terms of the design. And then they kept talking about how it was important they create the kind of leaders that would be able to support the continuous improvement. I was also real time experiencing, we were surfacing um, people's ideas and thoughts about how to fix the process and running right into like managers in the middle that were, I don't know, I wouldn't say they were against it. They were just kind of caught in the middle, not included in a way. And so they really weren't prepared uh, anywhere near sufficiently to say, oh yeah, give us your ideas and let's implement some of these, when obviously that's what you'd want to do. So that made me aware of it. So then we designed a fresh approach. They finally said, sure, okay, you have a new idea. And so we started working on it. So then after we designed it and we ran it, it was two days and then a month went by and then we did two more days and it worked. I mean, in terms of much more than I'd ever seen any leadership training work. And it wasn't because it was perfect training or some topics nobody had heard of yet. I think what I definitely witnessed was the leaders working together. This was like most of the leaders in an entire department, all sharing and connecting more, uh, working in twos and sharing in twos, threes, fours about their experience and the desire to shift um, to a more, uh, I guess, empowered model of working with their teams. And you certainly saw they want to be that way. They just struggled with what that looks like, how to do it. So that's really where the journey began because as I said, I'd never thought we'd ever get there. Uh, most of my career, we've always wanted leaders to be more coaching-like, but I'd never seen anything come close to making a difference. Okay. Since then, been working on it ever since. It's yeah. So how did, you progress, every day. how did you progress from that to the book and even more specifically, the title of the book? Because that's pretty interesting. So that, by the way, the title was, I think, the last, we were ready to go to print. I still didn't have a title. We kept coming up with these titles. I didn't like any of them. Then finally, one of my team said, Cheryl, like, what's the book about? I said, letting go. It's really about leaders needing to let go. And what that reflected was the many, many times when leaders were doing the things that they thought would be, you know, truly empowering, let their teams work more independently, they always describe being uncomfortable. So I always tell them, like, if you're uncomfortable, you're probably getting it because it's kind of uncomfortable. You'll have a sense your team will do it their own way. They probably won't even do it the way you would have done it. And you'll need to kind of let that go. Um, you'll be nervous sometimes. You'll be like, wonder if they break something or wonder if it doesn't work. And you let that go. Sometimes you know they're about to make a mistake and they need to learn from that mistake. You got to let that go. So there's a lot of letting go. And that's why I became such a believer that the support of the leaders with each other, feeling like they're all on that same path, they're, they're taking on that challenge together 
I think is a huge difference and something any any group could do. This is not like, you know, you have to have a special something to have your leaders support one another in, in being, uh, letting go more of the time, I guess is how I'd say it. Good. Yeah, one thing I notice is in a lot of things I've noticed over the years in doing um, not even just from the leadership aspect that you're talking about, but even some of the lean activities when you're in the thick of it, I've noticed uh, it'll feel somewhat awkward. Mm -hmm. it just, you know, because it just will feel awkward. And I'll, I'll say that to the teams I've had before. Says, I said, you know, that's okay. It's probably going to feel awkward. And we're probably not working on it enough if it doesn't feel awkward because you are um, working in areas that you haven't done before. That are unique, like you said, like letting go. That's most leaders have not worked in that area, so it's going to feel awkward. It's going to feel a little bit strange um, and uncomfortable to do that. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, that's along the again. same lines, Jim. What I'd mention is, I also found I believe before this ever started that a lot of people, leaders in the lean community that I certainly know and respect would sometimes kind of admit one in particular rings a bell with me that they themselves struggled. So I realized, I also think one thing leaders don't do readily is share that struggle, yeah. share that awkwardness and that they're having a hard time or they're not doing it as well as they want to, or even they think they might need to. So I think the other thing is really creating space for leaders to kind of really just talk about how hard that is, um, yeah. is really, I think really important when, it just makes sense to me. Leaders leading alone. I mean, the most common thing we hear is they're like, I thought I was the only one who felt like this. <laughs> would, they, would that be a form of only reflection? Once? When they, when they share all that, would that be like a form of reflection in that process of sharing and, and learning from each other? Yeah, I mean, usually at the end of it, they're always, it's not like that was the best training ever or those are best concepts I ever heard. It's like, it feels so good. to challenge with being a leader. I think leadership's a tough road. It's a really tough road. And a lot of times they, you feel like you have a lot of demands to get stuff done, get work done, um, get things accomplished, save money, all these other things, and then meet all the needs of your team. And they have a lot of needs. And so it's just like a lot. It's a lot. With that, so you talked about the aspect of them, obviously the name of the book, Letting Go, and where that came about, and they need to do that. Um, why is that important? Why, why should they? You know, why does it matter? Yeah. yeah. Boy, that goes back to my life's work, I think. Yeah. Um, I think this might roll into some bad Yeah, certainly I keep through. thinking, um, first of all, I thought at first this was going to be much more of a lean thing. Like it would be like you want the continuous improvement and you want to be able to surface the ideas and skills and talents of your people. And that has certainly been why I devoted my entire adult life to this topic. Um when I was first working, there was a time that I, uh, my very first job, I walked into Sweetheart Cup and I was watching employees, uh, Sweetheart Cup made uh, straws and paper plates and cups for fast food restaurants. And I saw, I saw employees really spending like a whole day packing cups and a whole day operating a piece of equipment with like three things they do. Um, a lot of fairly narrow defined work and eight hours of it with no Oh, shifting around to speak of. I could certainly see the waste of human talent there, but nothing prepared me for what I saw when we did a transformation in that environment. And then I saw how much talent and capability was all locked in there. Skills galore, technical skills and people skills and facilitation skills and problem solving skills, all just almost right under the surface, locked in jobs that were like this. So for instance, we started having the people do their own preventative maintenance. They did their own quality checks. They uh, participated in problem solving teams. They also overhauled the leadership team to being only the types that were more coaches than that, much less directive and more coaches. Never since that, um, there was one particular person that really touched me when I saw, he came into a meeting and he said, he put his shoulders back and he said, I shared with my family last night that I didn't know I could do this. I didn't know this was, I didn't know I could do this. And so I thought, not only is it a shame for an organization to miss that talent, it's certainly to me like really heartbreaking almost how much 
it means to a person to find out the full cadre of what their skills and capabilities are, what they might like to do if they weren't in a kind of a smaller job. Yeah, yeah it almost transcends them beyond just the job in and of itself. So to me, the whole thing's about having a better life, not just better work. The fact that you get better results is great. Yeah. So it's a, a great, um, almost, um, I wouldn't say it's a side note, but I mean, I would say it's also, it's much better quality of life. And even this book is devoted to better quality of life for leaders. It's not how to just lead better and demand more of yourself and push it a little harder and do a little more. It's more like, how can you lead and get more of your needs met and be happier? And, and yeah, not, and that definitely comes out. The, the weight of everyone's problems on your shoulders. Yeah, it definitely comes out in reading the book. One, one thing I, I, I noticed when I read the book, and I guess I had a little bit of, little bit of cheating or insight with this because before I read the book, we, you, we, have, we're, we do a workshop together where you teach some of the, the skills or the action say skills, habits of these. In a workshop, we're teaching skills but I really noticed um, from that, and then of course reinforced the book and you and I's conversations. I like to use a brick and mortar analogy, where these skills are, you know, these bricks. But these habits you go through and teach and get people to do that are that are more than just work stuff, but really beyond that, really create this mortar to make those skills much more stronger, much more powerful, and more impactful. Not only from the leader standpoint, but from their team and even back to the leader itself. So it really permeates you know, all, you know, ideally all parts of the organization and making, you know, even though the leader may be using these habits with his team, they pick up on some of these behavioral patterns and skills and get practice. And so they become better people, especially not only with the job they're doing, but if th those people become the people you choose from to move up into leadership roles, then they already have a lot of this in place. So I definitely picked that up from before and going through the book, which goes through it in more, in more detail. Yeah, like, so for instance, one of those um, habits is teach them to fish rather than, you know, let them solve their own problems. So there's a lot of skills in um, a, a, a given plant of skilled people like maintenance people or operations engineers, other people that are working side by side. They're all working on the equipment or getting production out. And they learn, they realize when people call them over, they have a tendency to like push them aside and let me fix it. Instead of asking questions, teach people to fix it themselves or get farther so they don't need them so much of the time. And then they start realizing. So that's like one of those things I've seen it becomes more pervasive. Are you solving anybody's problem that they should be learning, hopefully, to solve it for themselves? No matter yeah, what. and that's definitely one of the habits is, yeah, you said teach them to fish for solutions. In parentheses, don't solve their problems. And maybe go through that a little bit deeper because that's just, I think that's such an important point to not only being successful but back to developing not only the leader but also the team and, and all that and again that becomes kind of a kind of a, a circular reinforcement as well of not you know what what does it mean don't solve their problems how do we how do we not help them but you know actually I, by the way how do we not help them but also help them <laughs> how do you not help them M m many leaders I've met actually use this phrase. They'll be like, I know I should teach them to fish rather than, you know, feed them, so to speak, because it's a fairly um, common, well-known um, idea. But what I, what we talk about a lot, if I were to think of the kind of almost reflex, like, you know, if you go to the doctor and they hit your knee, like your leg <laughs> shoots up, when someone comes up to you and says, we're having a problem, and what do you think we should do about it? The instinct to solve it or address the problem is almost for many people, it's like overpowering. Like how would I not answer it or solve it? You know, they need me, they ask me for my help. And a lot of leaders also talk about, I even think of my role as a leader in a lot of ways is remove barriers and help with things. But as they keep looking at this, they also realize it just creates dependence. And a lot of times the reason why they're asking you is they're afraid to make a mistake um, feeling unsure of themselves. So what either I'm going to keep them in that mode or I have to help them grow out of it. Like, give it a try. Worst that happens is you're wrong. Now, obviously you don't do it when it's unsafe, um, or would be extremely costly, but starting to create more space that they really reinforce. You can make your own decisions. You can solve your own problems, work as a team. Like, why don't you guys work on it and come back with what you think you should do? But they all talk about that has to mean you can override that initial hope that says I should get in here and solve it. 
that's a really hard thing to slow down. Yeah, you saying that makes me think about one of the other habits you talk about in here, and you can um, um, articulate that a little more. He says, you know, level level um, level your team. So maybe explain. That's one of my favorites, by the way. Yeah. So I'm that. very fortunate. I'm very fortunate. I have had uh, the good fortune to experience um, a few times in my career what a workplace looks like that is a term that was, I don't think it's used very often anymore, self-managed, meaning the role of leadership has been pulled back fairly far and the teams set the schedule, get work out, take care of quality issues, um, even get more efficient all by themselves without, you know, not without leaders helping with that. So what I noticed about those environments, because that was a, that's been up for discussion for many decades already, is that, is that something that's possible? And people always think, well, it's not really possible because they apparently need so much. And what I saw in these environments is when, they, when people are no longer looking up, I'm not doing what my boss wants, I'm not doing what you know somebody above me wants, like I'm using my own judgment or the judgment of my team. First of all, they were much better results than anybody and they were something called hyper-engaged. I call it hyper-engaged. They were so prepared to do whatever needed to be done to take care of things. You realize leadership a lot of times, not the leaders, but leadership kind of locks a lot of that in. You got to get permission. You got to ask. Everything's got to get permission, got to ask, can't do anything unless somebody says so. And that just keeps pushing that, that talent in. So when it means level your team, it means don't train them to look up. Become mindful of how do we keep training them for our approval as a leader or the layers of leader. You can't make any decisions. How can we create more space a little at a time. There's another habit, let go responsibly. This is not abdicating responsibility and just walk away and let them do everything. That's not what I'm saying. But continue to step back and give teams more for ownership of the work. Yeah. I believe that with all my heart, that they're capable of much more than we generally ever put in their hands to handle. Yeah, actually somebody asked a question. I think it relates to one of you. That's the question, how can, how can I, improve engagement from experience, you know, people greater than 20 years, 20 year employees, how can they do that? And it made me, you know, looking at that question makes me think of one of your habits is motivate more. I, it sounds like those would be- right. Motivate more, help a little less, but yeah. that's much helping, a little more motivating. Um, you know, it's interesting to me, I had a leader a little bit ago say to me, we're really successful, we're gonna remove all the problems so our people when they come in in the morning can just do their work and they don't have any more problems. And I was thinking, I really never met a group of employees that would like all their problems removed. That's not what they're waiting for. They generally, first of all, it's naturally motivating and engaging to be able to solve issues that are in your way. So if there's things in your work that are problematic, like mistakes are made or they're hard to do or they hurt when you do them, um, then they really actually are engaged when they solve that. So I think to the question of how do we engage people? Here's what, um, I'm assuming you're potentially a continuous improvement environment. So there's certain key things known that engage people. And the good news is many things we do in continuous improvement are a complete overlap for them. So continuous improvement, especially when going full force is naturally engaging. Why? Because if we connect people to the larger vision, how do you fit into the bigger picture? So they find more meaning in their work. How do we help them find meaning their own personal meaning. What do you believe in personally and how does that show up in your work and maybe or your workplace? So there's that whole piece about connecting the meaning, uh, solving problems, um, being recognized by your super, having a good positive relationship with your manager and everything I've ever seen about a continuous improvement or a lean leader has to do with positive relationships with your team. Whatever that takes, you need to have positive relationships with your team. Um, that doesn't mean... Um, more dialogue, um, involving them more, talking to them more, um, figure out, asking them what needs, what they need. Um, it's not, you know, but you know, it's interesting. I think when it comes to engagement, there's a misnomer that somehow the leadership needs to fix something so people can be engaged. Like it's a problem for leaders to solve. And I've had so much more success when people identify their own problems and they're simply given more room to solve it for themselves.
facilitate that rather than I'll engage you somehow. I'll do it for you. Something that comes from the inside. So people need to do it for themselves, I think is how I phrase it. Yeah. And you, you mentioned earlier, leaders do struggle um, to, to let go like that. What are some things that uh, you would recommend it could be done to, to help, I guess, help them let go, help them in that cause? The first is community. So I even have a takeaway um, handout, which how to create what I call peer coaching. Like they just working in threes. You could do it in any room and you just put people either in pairs or threes. And one person gives a problem and the other person, their only two tools probably to start with is asking questions and listening. And the idea being, how could you practice in your peers what it means to coach? Like, how do I not solve your problem? How do I get used to that situation where I'm going to have all kinds of advice and ideas and I'm just going to coach and not act on it? So you can do that. What I've seen, by the way, that builds a coaching skill, but probably almost more importantly, when they finish that exercise, they're like, I feel more connected to everyone. I feel definitely a stronger bond with my other fellow leaders. And that's, I think, what anybody could do in your own organization. Um, the other thing about it, I would say practicing. I think there's an idea that with leaders arrive, somehow you get promoted to some level and now you can lead. And actually, I think of it more like how athletes, no matter what their sport, so to speak, I keep saying leadership's a team sport. I don't think you get it done. I don't think you arrive. I think creating places where people continue to practice skills helps them actually lead much better. And sending the message, you need to practice this stuff. You don't just get it. You don't go to a class or one training and you're changed now and you have a skill that you didn't have. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah, I was just, I was just gonna bring that up next because you repeat that repeat that throughout the, out the book is how important practice is and, uh, and to develop, you know, habits or these skills and through practice. And that's something too, ultimately, I guess what this impacts and something you and I have talked about over the years and even specific to, to this is really trying to create this coaching style of leadership, which is really about really, you know, organizations that are, I guess, trying to do the lean thing. They're really trying to change culture. So maybe comment on how this is really an impactful item on changing the culture or even you know, developing a culture, ideal a culture of continuous improvement? I guess the one way, I mean, that's, you know, that's a fairly complex question, but yeah. what comes to mind about it is, again, when I was a fairly young professional, I, I watched how certain dynamics in the workplace looked like parent-child dynamics. It was like asking permission and getting in trouble. Like when I first saw what writing people up looked like, I'm like, it seems very almost parental. Like you're in trouble and you get disciplined. And I realized when we come out of that, this coaching style is also much more, I think, about an adult-adult work environment. It's more truly respectful of each other's capabilities, ability to take responsibility. I think fundamentally, we need to have more of a sense that people are capable of being responsible for themselves. They, they are able to be responsible. In many ways, I believe people, you'll get from people how you treat them. You treat people like, dynamic problem solvers who are capable of being quite responsible for any number of things. I just think we're more likely to see that. So I believe the culture is very noticeably going to have that, that sense of, I call it egalitarian, but it just has that sense of equality and, and not falling into traps that because you have that job and I have that job, this job, you're not as smart as me or you're not as capable as me or you're more limited than I am. I saw this when I was young and I haven't changed my mind by now that I still think some of those are just paradigms about what people are capable of. Yeah, and one thing when I was going through and reading the book, one thing I, I noticed, not only in reading the book, it's just some of the um, stories or, or things that you explain in there. And I also, that led me back to the workshop we're doing where I had these observations is when people are learning the skills and the skills, you know, and that when we're doing, they're learning the skills of TWI, job instruction, job methods, job relations, also the kata, improvement kata and coaching kata, with the coaching parallels with a lot of this, is as you are teaching these habits of th th those skills of this, how, like I said, by, go back to that brick and mortar analogy that these habits strengthen greatly all those other skills that we're trying to teach. And eventually, eventually to some degree, they kind of immerse 
which each other, which again goes back to me thinking through is, okay, well, these are like the fundamentals and essence of creating this culture, like say of continuous improvement, because they have these skills, they're doing these things, they're the the not solving problems for people is trying to push the problem solving down to the level at which they happen, and all those things, all this helps create the ability and habits and behaviors that allow uh, people, teams, or an organization to do this. So I, I, I saw that very, that was very potent in reading through this. You know, Jim, I always say when I started it, I thought it was going to be one thing, like first line supervisory training. That's what I thought we were building. Over time, it's taught us what it's partly game for. One is certainly leadership development. It's, but probably almost just as importantly, it's like a implementation tool. So if you think of continuous improvement, in many ways, it's stuff we implement, right? So we yeah. have either ways of working, you know, daily management or other things that we're trying to put in place. This was the bricks and mortar around, how do you get clear on what your, what's your, what's, first of all, what's the vision? What's my expectation? And make sure it's clearly understood and that everyone has everything they need to be successful. To how do we really make sure people are trained well enough to do what we're asking of them? Like one round of problem solving training does not make a skill. So are we doing enough to train? Assuming they've been trained, are we coaching after that? Are we right there able to provide the coaching and support to bring it in. Feedback for improvement, which is just another form of coaching. So if there's something off track, do we really take the time to effectively support someone in a new level of performance? Last but not least, are we recognizing the behaviors, even pieces that are all getting us there? And so what the teams came back and said, this is, they became more able to do continuous improvement because it was more broken down, like say more rubber on the road to get it done. Instead of like, we don't know why we're not getting it. Yeah, well, I mean, like you use, obviously use the term in the title and the name of the book, have habits of getting this where people just have it. They don't stop and go, okay, I, I'm in this situation, so therefore I need to do. No, they just kind of default into the behavioral pattern through the practice, through the experience, and through the circumstances. They just automatically default into these patterns and utilize these, these skills. And I think that's, and again, that's, to me, that's the emergence of the culture. Is they just they just go they do they just do they don't really have to stop they don't have to get permission they just do and over time through the practice eventually that's where it kind of emulsifies together that they just, they work as a team you know like they work as a team well they're just doing it kind of like a sports team well they practice so in the dynamics of the game they just by habit work as a team to you know reach their objectives which makes me think of something else you do bring up in here around organizational alignment how that plays an impact on this. Yeah, so you're, um, tell me like, how could I, tell me what you'd like me to expound on. Yeah, so what role, what role in in the habits you go through, you know, with your core that you teach you here? You mean like up and down the chain of command? Is that what you mean by organization? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. So again, this is what it taught us. I didn't see this coming actually. So one of the things uh, we started doing is we did like problem solving in small groups as leaders got these skills, we said, pick problems that are in your environment and let's take a look at them. Basically solving the people part of the problem. Um, so anybody you know, familiar with like fishbone analysis, one aspect of many problems is the people part. And so this is very much, how do you pull that apart? What's missing for the people not to be doing what you need them to do? And as part of that, it, we uncovered that many, many times the layers of leadership are all like on top of each other. Everybody's almost working two layers down. Um, so we, we started to realize, so the expectation of doing a job and the expectation to coach the person doing the job, much less the expectation to coach a coach of someone doing a job are completely different expectations. And the more they get treated like it's all the same thing. So if we want improved safety or we want improved anything, Everybody from senior leadership down, like all, like they just pile on it. And so what they're seen to do it better, they have to kind of step into their real role. So like at a senior leader, we're in charge of vision and asking our direct reports to oversee a scope of work and what's inside that. And then, and so on and so on. Um, instead of like, well, we'll just all discuss what people doing the work should be doing differently as if it's all the same. 
Okay. Well, if folks do this, they, the leaders get successful in developing their teams using these, these habits. What can they achieve? Well, I've always said, I think we underestimate really the value of continuous improvement. When a lot of times it's considered like, can we improve our cost of quality or be more efficient? I think it's way less valuable. Actually, there was a question around engagement. Engagement, if you increase engagement, is known to be considerably more profitable than most any other thing you can do to change your workplace. Team members who are more engaged bring to work something we call discretionary effort. They bring more to the party, and so you get more out of it. And you'll have lower turnover. You'll have more um, interest in doing things. So that's, um, I mean, there's studies that say it's 9 to 11%. There's one in particular I use a lot. 9 to 11% greater profitability. Gallup has, I mean, I've been collecting every study on engagement that has any financial value. Um, Gallup has several uh, stats on that. But I do believe the value of continuous improvement in this style of leadership is a more engaged workforce, for sure. Okay. Do you, do you have like a specific example of someone that's done this or, you know, been able to let go and uh, um, what results they achieve from it? Well, so one of the groups more recently that I've been working with the last couple of years, who, again, now they teach this all internally. I'm not there anymore. It's designed all the ideas. It's meant to be owned internally. It does, it's not meant for like a consultant or someone else to need to inter, to run things. So what they've seen is after getting probably all their leaders through that, one, they saw there was almost a line to get at the team lead jobs. So whenever there was an opening for a people leader role, people wanted those spots. Up until then, they couldn't find people who wanted those jobs. They were like, well, we don't know how to do the job. It looks painful. It looks hard. So they started to have bench strength so they could more pick and choose better, um, better choices of how to support the workplace. Um, they certainly saw better results in terms of... Um, Everything about the work improved in terms of efficiency and quality and all of that. Um, and just, I think what they found most valuable, clarity in how leaders need to lead. A lot of workplaces, if you said, what is it you believe need to happen with your leaders? What's their standard work? I imagine there's people who would say, yep, we have it. And there's also a lot that don't. We don't have a clear way to really grow leaders that this type of a continuous improvement culture needs. Okay, great. Well, actually, Cheryl, I think we're at our target time already. I know. This was very fun. You can it tell it. By, it flies by. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank so you. With, with that, you know, again, thank you, Cheryl, so much. Um, like I said, you know, I mentioned uh, uh, Let Go to Lead is the book. I said I, I, I loved it because it just it gave me this great idea of, of habits, things to do, skills that, like I said, really um, resound with me because, like I said, like a mortar – to, to more strongly uphold the things you're probably already doing or need to do. But also too, with Cheryl, you can, you can learn more from Cheryl. And also too, real quick, if you have any more questions we you didn't get to, certainly just reach out to us at Lean Frontiers and, and we'll get them to Cheryl, get, get, them, get you connected with her. She could answer them. But Cheryl will be keynoting at the Lean Coaching Summit in Indianapolis, July um, 23rd through the 25th. Also doing a workshop on this, on the habits, July 23rd. Um, so you can uh, learn more there, plus companies presenting on what they're doing with this. And uh, you can find out more and learn more at uh, Lean Frontier, leanfrontiers.com, the website, to learn more about that and register for it. So Cheryl, thank you very much. You're very um, welcome. Looking forward to carrying on with this with you and uh, learning more, actually even coming up in July. Yeah, looking forward to it too. And the other speakers, by the way, I think are just going to be dynamite. I'm Even I'm excited to see the full cadre of speakers, some good companies and a lot to share about what their journeys with creating stronger leaders. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you, if you want, if you would just want your brain saturated with great lessons and learning and connections with people, that's the place to be Lean Coaching Center. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you everybody very much. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon.